In this video we are going to derive the essential equations for simple harmonic motion. So the first thing we're going to look at is the kinematics equations. And you'll notice that the displacement of a body undergoing simple harmonic motion can be described with the wave equation. That is, the amplitude multiplied by the cosine of the phase. Well, in kinematics it's more useful to talk about how something varies with time. So let us take that phase and equate it to 2 pi ft, where 2 pi is one full rotation, one full oscillation, one full cycle, and f is the frequency, the reciprocal of the time period. You can see from this part here that the phase is just a fraction of a full cycle, but we're writing that fraction in terms of the time period, t over the time period. The angular frequency is defined as 2 pi f. So the phase can be written as omega t, the angular frequency multiplied by the time. We can substitute that into the first equation to get the equation for displacement as a function of time. And that equation is going to appear several times in this derivation, so it's worth making a note of it. And as I've done here, I've drawn a square around it, a rectangle around it, just to make it more emphasized in my working. Velocity is the first derivative of displacement. So that's dx by dt, where x is a function of t. And we know what that function of t is, because I wrote it within that rectangle. The velocity is therefore d by dt of a cosine omega t. Now omega t is a function of t, and cosine omega t is therefore a function of a function of t. So we have to use the chain rule. If you're studying A-level maths, then you may well have learnt the chain rule already. And if you haven't yet learnt it and you are studying A-level maths, then you will learn it. But even if you're not studying A-level maths, it's not too difficult to understand. You can see how it's highlighted here that the d theta would cancel out to give you dx by dt again. Now we have x as a function of theta written here. And we have theta as a function of t written here. A graph of y equals cosine theta would look like this, a pretty standard cosine graph. And you'll notice that the gradient at the top here is zero. The gradient here is negative and takes a maximum value. The gradient here is zero. And the gradient over here is positive and takes a maximum value. The gradient here is zero. And one complete oscillation, 360 degrees, we're using radians on this x-axis, so it comes just between 6 and 6.5 radians. It's 2 pi. If I were to plot a graph of the gradient of this line, each point on this line, it would look like this. Now, it's not good practice to plot on the same set of axes two quantities that are dimensionally different, but I'm going to show these two quantities on this same graph just for simplicity. When the gradient of the red line is zero, the blue line has a value of zero. When the gradient of the red line is negative and takes the maximum value, the blue line is negative and has the maximum value. When the gradient of the red line is zero, the blue line is zero. When the gradient of the red line is positive and takes the maximum value, the blue line takes the maximum value positive. And the blue line is a minus sign. It's the same as a sign, but it's inverted in the y-axis. If we were to differentiate a cosine function, what we're doing is finding the gradient, a function that tells you what the gradient is. So differentiating a cosine function gives you a minus sign function. So this is an easy computation. d omega t by dt is just omega. And dx by d theta, where x is a cosine theta, becomes minus a sine theta. And that's because d cosine theta d theta is minus sine theta. So using the chain rule highlighted at the top here, we get what's highlighted at the bottom. dx by dt is minus a omega sine of omega t. And because dx by dt is the velocity as a function of t, 
this is the expression for velocity. That's another very important expression that can come up again in the future. With this expression, if you know the time and you know the angular frequency and the amplitude, you can calculate what the velocity is at that time for a body undergoing simple harmonic motion. In simple harmonic motion, the amplitude and the angular frequency will remain constant. Acceleration is the second derivative of displacement. It's the first derivative of velocity. So here we're going to differentiate the equation for velocity as a function of time with respect to time. Again, omega t is a function of t, and sine omega t is therefore a function of a function of t. So again, we have to use the chain rule. Except this time, we are using the chain rule to calculate what dv by dt is. And again, you can see that d theta will cross cancel, so it's quite easy to follow. If we were to differentiate a minus sine function, we'll do the same steps. At zero, the value is negative and the maximum value. At this point here, the blue line's gradient is zero. So a new graph of the gradient would have zero. At this point here, the blue line has a positive gradient taking the maximum value. Here, the gradient of the blue line is zero, and so on. So a graph of the gradient of the blue line would look like the green line. So the green line is a function which is the gradient of the blue line. We would say that the green line is the derivative of the blue line, and the blue line is the derivative of the red line. These are those three graphs all together. Just as before, d theta by dt was omega, and d sine theta by d theta is cosine theta. So using that identity, we get this equation here. Putting those previous two equations together, we get dv by dt is minus a omega squared cosine omega t. But notice that a cosine omega t was defined as x earlier on. So we can substitute this into the previous equation. And we learned that a is directly proportional to x with a negative coefficient, minus omega squared. Now this is often cited as the definition of simple harmonic motion. And it falls out of the derivation of the equation for the acceleration of a body undergoing simple harmonic motion. You'll notice the green line is exactly the same shape as the red line, but inverted in the y-axis. The red line is a cosine. The green line is a minus cosine. The green line is the second derivative of the red line. If the red line represents the displacement of a body undergoing simple harmonic motion as a function of time, then the green line represents the acceleration of the body undergoing simple harmonic motion as a function of time. You'll notice the displacement and the acceleration always have the opposite sign, but they are always directly proportional in magnitude. And that's because omega is a constant in simple harmonic motion. There are a few other very useful equations that we're going to derive now. Sometimes it can be useful to calculate v as a function of x. We know v as a function of t. We derived that before. The first stage in this derivation is to square that equation. So minus a omega squared becomes a squared omega squared. Sine omega t squared becomes sine squared omega t. And of course v squared is just v squared. The reason why we've squared everything is so we can use this identity that sine squared of an angle is equal to 1 minus cosine squared of the same angle. So I can use that identity to rewrite that previous equation like this. If we multiply out the square bracket, we get this. Remember we had an equation for x as a function of t. And that's going to be very useful here. And this is the reason why we did all this, because we want to get v as a function of x. So we can substitute this into the previous equation. And v squared now becomes a squared omega squared minus x squared omega squared we can factor the omega squared out. So v squared becomes omega squared multiplied by a squared minus x squared. Taking the square root of that equation yields the equation at the bottom, which is v as a function of x.
Remember that a, the amplitude, is a constant and omega is a constant. X can take a value of anywhere from positive a to negative a. That's the range of values X can take. And you get the maximum v when X is zero. Because when X is zero, you're subtracting nothing from the a squared term. So the equation for v as a function of x we've just derived here becomes simply this, with the x term equaling 0. We can take the square root of a squared, and that's equal to a. I dropped the plus or minus because we're interested in finding the magnitude of the maximum velocity, or the maximum speed of the particle. The last kinematics equation that we can derive is the equation for maximum acceleration. With all the maths we've done so far, with the trig identities and differentiation using the chain rule, this derivation perhaps seems a bit trivial. But the maximum acceleration happens when x takes the maximum value it can. The maximum value x can take is a, the amplitude. So the maximum acceleration, and again, I'm not so worried about the sign here, but the maximum magnitude of acceleration is omega squared multiplied by the amplitude. So I've showed you here how to derive those six key kinematics equations for simple harmonic motion. To derive the time period of a mass spring system, we first of all have to consider what forces are acting on the mass. So here's the system we're looking at at the moment, a spring and a mass connected to it. We are ignoring the effect of gravity, so perhaps this mass is on a surface with no friction. And the spring can be both compressed and extended, and obeys Hooke's law. We have decided that the positive direction in this case is to the right. And so the mass oscillates around some equilibrium position. As the mass moves to the left, it has a negative displacement. And as it moves to the right, it has a positive displacement. You'll notice when the displacement is negative, the spring will be compressed, producing a force to the right. So using Hooke's law, we have a minus here to indicate that a negative displacement has a positive force, and vice versa. In this equation, k is the spring constant, or the stiffness constant. If we assume uniform mass, then we can use this version of Newton's second law. Force is equal to mass multiplied by acceleration. And these two forces are the same, so we can equate these two equations, just like this. We also derived before an expression for the acceleration of a body undergoing simple harmonic motion as a function of x. And I've written that equation here. Now we can substitute that equation into the previous equation, which gives us this. And dividing through by minus x, we get this m omega squared equals k. Remember omega, the angular frequency, was equal to 2 pi f, and f was equal to the reciprocal of the time period, so omega is equal to 2 pi over t. We can substitute that into the previous equation, and we get m multiplied by 4 pi squared over t squared equals k, where t is the time period, and it's the time period we want to find. So we'll rearrange the equation to get t squared as the subject, and then we'll take the square root. And so that's how we derive this expression. Now technically this should be plus or minus, but a negative time period doesn't make any physical sense. So we're just going to take the positive root. Now what if we have our spring, then our mass system, so that it's arranged and gravity is also attracting the mass downwards? In this case there are two forces acting on this mass. There's the force upwards from the spring, which I've labelled stretching force, S, and the weight of this mass down. When those two are in equilibrium, the mass is in its equilibrium position. Well, this stretching force is proportional to the extension of the spring. So at a certain extension of spring, it reaches equilibrium. But then about that point, as it oscillates, Hooke's law still applies. At equilibrium, the weight of the body is going to equal the force of the spring pulling this body upwards again. And that force of the spring pulling upwards is going to be equal to the spring constant multiplied by the extension of the spring at this point when the mass is at the equilibrium position. Let's decide that downwards is the positive direction. 
Well, in that case, the resultant force on this mass is equal to the weight downwards minus this spring force upwards at the equilibrium position but then also minus any additional spring force you get by displacing this mass further. If the mass is pulled down a bit further, there's going to be more of this spring force pulling the mass back up. And because this additional spring force, kx, is pulling the mass up, we say it's negative. x here is the displacement from the equilibrium position. And you can see that the equation checks out. The resultant force is still the weight minus the upward force because of the spring. And you can see the upward force because of the spring increases as x increases in the positive direction. Now because s was equal to mg, that means that mg minus s is just equal to zero. So our equation just becomes f equals minus kx, which is exactly what we had initially. So even if the mass is suspended vertically and there is gravity, it doesn't change this equation at all. For the derivation of the time period of a simple pendulum, it's a little bit more tricky. So let's start with a sketch of our simple pendulum, which you can see here on the left. The pendulum has length L, has a mass M, so its weight acting directly downwards is Mg. There's a component of the weight acting perpendicular to the string, and that's our restoring force for this simple harmonic oscillator. The pendulum bob is displaced by an angle of theta. And we're going to use the convention where positive theta is anti-clockwise. So we have a component of weight that is perpendicular to the string. And that's going to be our restoring force F. Our restoring force F is equal to ma for constant mass. That's Newton's second law for constant mass. Equating these two equations and cancelling the mass gives us this equation here, but we have to be a bit careful about the direction. Because when theta is positive, the acceleration of the pendulum bob will be to the left. So let's put a minus in there to indicate a leftward acceleration when we have a positive angular displacement of this pendulum bob. If this pendulum undergoes simple harmonic motion, then we know its acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x. We derived that before. These two equations can be combined to produce this equation here. You take the first equation here, multiply it through by minus 1, and then equate it with the second equation here. And you end up with the third equation at the bottom. Now we can say the displacement of the pendulum bob from the equilibrium position is equal to L sine theta. You can see that's not quite right, is it? Because this length here, which is what L sine theta would be, is not the same as a displacement. But for very small angles, it's very, very close. As the angle increases, then this L sine theta deviates more and more from what the true displacement is. L sine theta ends up much longer than the displacement. So this is called a small angle approximation, where we're saying the displacement of the pendulum bob is equal to L sine theta for small thetas. And by small theta, we're talking a few degrees. That equation can be rearranged like this. We can then substitute that into this equation here to get this equation here. There's an x on both sides, which can be cancelled. And we end up with this equation here. We can take the square root of this equation. And we know that omega is equal to 2 pi f, so we can substitute that. And then rearrange to get frequency as the subject, if you want. But we weren't looking for frequency, we were looking for time period. And the time period is defined as the reciprocal of frequency. Or the reciprocal of time period is the frequency. So we can substitute that. Well, we're nearly there, we just need to take the reciprocal of this equation. And there we have it. For very small angles of angular displacement for the pendulum, we have an expression for the time period of a pendulum. So if you know any year 10s or 11s with a particular passion for mathematics who enjoy physics, you can show them this slide, you can show them this presentation, and you can explain to them that 
when you get on to A level, there is plenty of mathematics to be found. So if you want to get notifications from YouTube when I upload new videos or when I go live on Sunday mornings for my live tutorials, then please do like uh, and subscribe, like the video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, ring that little bell and you'll be notified. Thank you very much.